does that feel? Gliding, flying through deep fresh snow. Everyone who's experienced it will know what I mean. When everything goes right, this question, I meet with Xavier Delarue, possibly the most accomplished freerider of our time, who's tested the outer boundaries in our sport like no one else has. Can you actually remember the first time we met? Mm, no, that's too, that's too far back. My brain doesn't work far. <laughs> far <I think. laughs> when was that? Uh, I think it was 17 years ago. having dinner or something and I was like quite stunned by like what you do and I I just remember that memory like oh he's the free riding guy does these big lines and stuff although in fact it was only the start of this career yeah. for you wasn't it yeah I was already had been like four five six years that I started filming free riding and doing free ride competitions back then I mean, I've always kept track. We've crossed paths quite a lot, I think, but never ridden really together. Yeah. Yeah. I think most of all because our goals of what we were seeking in riding was so different, right? And it's still different. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, it's still very different, yeah, yeah. yes. Back then I was like doing slope style contests. And then I really got into backcountry riding, but always with this playful approach.
those natural features. Wind lips, playing around, that's really what I love the best. <laughs> I'm not even looking for these big lines unless they have like playful features in them. We all need to find uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, our yeah. happiness somewhere. Yeah. Right. But we definitely uh, have different interests, yeah. Yeah, I think mine is more from, like, really inspired by mountaineering, you know, I, yeah. And it's always been like this, like, even before I started riding big lines, I remember being like a child and looking at the mountains and being like, how can I get up there? And uh, I want to learn snowboarding to being able to get up there. It was always clear to me, yeah. Did you come from mountaineering, from climbing, and was that sort of your background? <laughs> right down there. No, in my family, so my uncles and dad did a lot of mountaineering, but my uncle passed away when he was uh, young, uh, like 23 in the 70s, and I think that left a bit of a stigma in my family. And so uh, didn't do any climbing, and then that's Did he 18. pass away climbing? Yeah, 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 in Chamonix, yeah, got a stone on his head. And, he was really charging a uh, super heavy metal mountaineering. When I was 18, I left the house, started my own life, and I, I remember I bought climbing stuff and I went on the cliffs, okay, how do you do it? And I started from there and then really got attracted into like long route climbing. And, and and then mountaineering, and that gave me really uh, the will to kind of adapt this into snowboarding. It's getting really serious. Let's go. But then there has been a, a sort of strive for you to like test the limits and, and really expose yourself in some ways into like the raw elements early on, like or you found a lot of beauty in it. I find beauty not just in the fact of uh, putting myself in an exposed situation, but it's more like in living the adventure of accessing this this point, which looks inaccessible in a way. And uh, and basically, over the years, you develop all these techniques which give you the tools to get up there and feel comfortable. So. Slowly it becomes your world, you get used to it, you've got your margin of safety so that you can, you know, push things further and further. And I think that's the kind of adventure, yeah. yeah. I still love it, yeah. It's interesting because I do think that our longing for adventure mm -hmm. has taken different shapes and forms now in our mm -hmm. time where we could literally fly to the other side of the world, mm -hmm. but then get into the same scene, eat the same food. So where do you find adventure? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe we go to the mountains to an area we feel less 
comfortable or we're just more exposed to something new. So you take the small line here, huh? Yeah, I think right I'll just the, take yeah. the small line yeah, just yeah. above here and then down. I think down. those spines are going to look beautiful though. Yeah. yeah. And then actually here, that could be another oh, little yeah, feature. Totally. How does it feel below that rock, Xavier? Just has that crazy image of that rock sitting above you. Yeah, yeah. But going through it was so fucking cool. Yeah. yeah. Five, four, three, two, drop. Yeah, don't you think also that, especially in a society where everything is so, like, put in a frame, is so standardized in a way, and like risk is not a part really of that, the whole equation, that in these lines, in these moments where you climb, you're in there, you're in the element, you find yourself in a mental state which is like a bit animal-like and which is probably what people used to feel a lot more when life was a lot more insecure. makes us all feel good you know you're in the moment you you know you don't think anymore about your money your job your whatever your kids your future you're you're in there you're a bit like an animal I think that's yeah I'm addicted to this feeling uh, a little bit yeah No, and I, I, I really enjoy that feeling, be sort of on the edge, but like be okay with it. Mm -hmm. But when the consequences are potentially life-threatening, then I find it very easily very uncomfortable. Mm. Like I've found myself in a situation where I was like, okay, you know, like get down there as safe as possible. But it wasn't something I was enjoying as much. It was more like...
I try to really fight, you know, the situation with, where you're with your friends, it's like the super good day, and you just don't want to think of the annoying part of the risk, you know, because it is annoying. It, it does take away some of the fun of your day, but yeah, I will force myself to be like, okay, worst, worst case scenario, uh, how, how do I prevent it? And that helps me take the decision if I drop or not, yeah. How, yeah, how's, how's this season been in retrospect and everything? I walked into this season, still blocked crazy heavily from last winter. So last winter being super unstable all winter long and also witnessing for the first time someone dying and even on top of that, uh, someone that I know. So that has left so many, uh, wounds in me after the season and like starting the season I was terrified. I was doing um, like a big live seminar about avalanche safety and everything and the next day it was like first bluebird day and I hate like this is the kind of day that I hate because everybody's just like so crazy there's so much tension everybody wants to drop everywhere and he's going to be so scared of missing like the first line and stuff so that creates such a unhealthy tension and when I got up there I saw this big slide coming down and wow I was like oh this is big but I really did not take it serious and then I heard a, a guy being like, oh, there's someone down there. And, and I started digging, like there was only the balloon sticking out and I started uh, digging out. And then a friend of mine comes in and he saw the board sticking out and he was like, oh no, that's our friend. Like one of ours from the community in Verbia. And I, was like, oh, I did not even recognize him from all the shocks and stuff, from all the impacts. And, and yeah, and then the whole rescue process uh, went about and I don't know, it just, uh, like my brain did not function, it was so intense. I did kind of the right things around, but I felt like so helpless in a way and, and so useless. I heard you experienced that accident and I think two days later I ran into a very similar situation mm -hmm. simultaneously on the other side of the Alps. I was riding in the resort and then I saw an avalanche coming down. I was with friends and we didn't really know what happened if anyone was in it or... And so we went around and, and, and got to the debris and then we saw a lot of people shoveling already. So we, we came over to help and as we were shoveling already since a while we were the first one to like take over and then to also Get to the, the body. Yeah. Get to the body, which have, yeah, which was a boy. He was 15 years old, and um, yeah, I mean, it was so surreal. He was like, it seemed like he was not here anymore, mm. but we were fighting for his life. We were doing CPR, and there was the chance for him to bring him back and. Mm everything we were doing at this moment like free riding it seemed so surreal so useless honestly
towards the beginning of next season, that's where it's been feeling the, the hardest and the heaviest because you know, you've taken the distance from it all. You've seen, you know, the pain that it has caused to all, all the friends around, to all the family. You know, it really made me, you know, not enjoy free riding and like wonder myself, why am I doing this in a way like, yeah. There we are, exposing ourselves to dangers and, and uncovering a boy 15 years of age doing just what he loves, what we've dedicated our lives to as well. Yeah, and what we've publicized as well, because like, uh, that's a lifestyle that we try to encourage people to get into also. Yeah, that's the tricky part as well. But at the same time, a year down the line, like, what do we do? You can't, you can't stop on these situations here. That's the thing. I don't see the solution being like, okay, so now you're going to like just hide away and and try and like leave all this out that filled your life with joy. But I think, especially for us and being professionals, it's it's matter of like how we communicate how we can contribute in some ways for this not to happen as much anymore and also elaborate sort of on our own decisions how much is it worth yeah true and there's not a clear answer to that either taken in this crazy, crazy avalanche, like huge. Got taken down like over two kilometers down the mountains. Basically the unsurvivable. Then it was a miracle that I was alive. So I was like, boom, I'm done with free riding. I had a daughter already at the time, she was like almost three years old. I was like, come on, like, this is so irresponsible. After a few days, I remember being in the hospital room and like checking out the peaks with like full of snow and surprising myself being like, after what happened, you're still reading lines on the mountain, like what's wrong with you? And, and then being like, oh, actually, you must really, really like this. And I, from there on, I was like, all right, okay, I, I got to find a way to put like a bit of a structure in my head to, you know, to uh, to have a good approach, which I feel safe. It will never be 100% safe because it's a dangerous sport, but there's a way to make it a lot safer. Do you, yeah. yeah. Do you think we're tricking ourselves with that though? I saw what happened to you, but then those years that followed, you were kind of setting a whole new level in the sport. Almost dying, but then to even go out even further, even harder, was something couch counterintuitive for me to do. Mm -hmm. sort of James Bond 
scene where it's like, oh, he's almost got taken, but like he found a way to control it, and at the end of the day, he does it anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's been some years where I've really been onto it, but I felt such a drive inside me, and I know I was taking a lot of risk, but I felt fairly comfortable with it. But I haven't felt the same with the, the death experience from someone else. Like that has had very different impact. Because the outcome has also been a different one. Broken, huh? Yeah. It's broken, Daddy. Mm hmm. Maybe it's broken inside too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's bad, huh? You have a helmet all the time, huh? No. No, no, no. It's broken. Yeah, and you go fast, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Daddy, I want this. You want what? What is this? You want to wear it? No, it's too big. It's too big. Oh, no. Yeah. You want to try again? Yeah, I want to see. If we open it, maybe it works. It's more. You have a big head. Oh! It's not fit. Effect. It's not fit, Amri. Yeah, it does fit you. No, it's Actually, not. it does. It's a big one. Yeah, but you've got a big head. That's really what, like, of course, this is what's running in my head, you know, like all along. Oh, there's a difference from like Xavier 13 years ago to like you now, and something has changed from, say, how old is your middle daughter? My middle daughter is three years old. Three years old? Yeah. When your oldest daughter was three years old, you were probably like, Charging. Yeah, I was on that trajectory. Yeah. Yeah, I'm way, way, way more chill than I used to be back then. And yeah, even though I was a father, even though that was that was a big thing in my head, I still had that thing I needed to do. And yeah, and I did it. And like, yeah, could be seen as selfish, but I don't know. It felt like it was the thing I needed to do. Mm. So many times I went when I shouldn't have and, and and I'm still here because I've been lucky. Like that's a big big part of it. You know like that that phase of proving it of needing to be someone and stuff like I don't have that. You know, I'm expressing myself in a different way. Like back in the days, it was all about killing it, proving, proving, proving. And now it's more like, I feel it's more like passing a message. So I can, I feel I can be a lot more present and yeah, more connected. I can take the time and yeah. 
It feels really nice, like, yeah. Very different, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's why I found it uh, interesting to connect with you and hear about that, what you've kind of, like, how you've processed it and your ideas of risk and everything you've, like, taken from being exposed to it for so many years. I may have tried to prove myself more out there than in other fields of life, but that couldn't hide the fact how, like, maybe in other areas I was just as vulnerable and just as, like, scared. I've been really finding that actually going back up there made me really click with it and made me more aligned with it, with the fact of doing it. Whereas like early season, like being away from the mountains and just having these bad images in my head, it's just like, uh, yeah, you don't understand anymore. I don't know why, but I really feel that it does make my life fulfilled. You know, it gives me a purpose. Even though, in a way, you could say that it has no meaning and no purpose at all. It still does that. with Xavier was super valuable. I guess there are certain experiences that fundamentally shake our approach to life, forcing us to see just how fragile it really is. Have we taken on to unrealistic ideas of control and how to obtain a reasonable balance between our love for adventure and a misguided drive to prove ourselves. sense for who we are and what we do and a different way of being brave by opening up to being vulnerable. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Mommy, what's the... Oh.
Okay, you turn it off. <laughs> she found the button. <laughs> uh, it's so outgoing, huh? Yeah, yeah. All the time. <laughs>